Even iron is not plentiful. This has been inferred from the sort of weapons they have. Only a few of them use swords or large lances. They carry spears with short and narrow blades, but so sharp and easy to handle that they can be used, as required, either at close quarters or in long-range fighting. Their horsemen are content with a shield and a spear, but the foot soldiers also rain javelins on their foes, each of them carries several, and they hurl them to immense distances, being naked or lightly clad in short cloaks. There is nothing ostentatious about their equipment, only their shields are picked out in the colors of their choice. Few have breastplates, and only one here and there a helmet of metal or hide. Their horses are not remarkable for either beauty or speed, and are not trained to execute various evolutions as ours are. They ride them straight ahead, or with just a single wheel to the right, keeping their line so well that not a man falls behind the rest. Generally speaking, their strength lies in infantry rather than cavalry, so foot soldiers accompany the cavalry into action their speed of foot being such that they can easily keep up with the charging horsemen. The best men are chosen from the whole body of young warriors and placed with the cavalry in front of the main battle line. The number of these is precisely fixed. A hundred are drawn from each district, and the hundred is the name they bear among their fellow countrymen. Thus, what was originally a mere number has become to be a title of distinction. The battle line is made up of wedge-shaped formations. To give ground to the enemy, provided that you return to attack, is considered a good tactic rather than cowardice. They bring back the bodies of the fallen even when a battle hangs in the balance. To throw away one's shield is the supreme disgrace, and the man who has thus dishonored himself is debarred from attendance at sacrifice or assembly. Many such survivors from the battlefield have ended their shame by hanging themselves. They choose their kings from their noble birth, their commanders for their valor. The power even of the kings is not absolute or arbitrary. The commanders rely on example rather than on the authority of their rank, on the admiration they win by showing conspicuous energy and courage, and by pressing forward in front of their own troops. Capital punishment, imprisonment, even flogging are allowed to none but the priests and are not inflicted merely as punishments or on the commander's orders, but as it were in obedience to the god whom the Germans believe to be present on the field of battle. They actually carry with them into the fight certain figures and emblems taken from their sacred groves. A specially powerful incitement to valor is that the squadrons and divisions are not made up at random by the mustering of chance comers, but are each composed of men of one family or clan. Close by them, too, are their nearest and dearest, so that they can hear the shrieks of their womenfolk and the wailing of their children. These are the witnesses whom each man reverences most highly, whose praise he most desires. It is to their mothers and wives that they go to have their wounds treated, and the women are not afraid to count and compare the gashes. They also carry supplies of food to the combatants and encourage them. It stands on record that armies already wavering and on the point of collapse have been rallied by the women, pleading heroically with their men, thrusting forward their bared bosoms, and making them realize the imminent prospect of enslavement a fate which the Germans fear more desperately for their women than for themselves. Indeed, you can secure a surer hold on these nations if you compel them to include among a consignment of hostages some girls of noble family. More than this, they believe that there resides in women an element of holiness and a gift of prophecy, and so they do not scorn to ask their advice or lightly disregard their replies. In the reign of the Emperor Vespasian, we saw Valida, long honored by many Germans as a divinity, and even earlier they showed a similar reverence for Urenia and a number of others, untainted by servile flattery or any presence of turning women into goddesses.